This video is brought to you by Sporlin, quality, integrity, and tradition. Um, we've got a service call today on a walk-in freezer that wasn't working right. And I walk in, the freezer coils at 35 degrees, but listen, sounds like you can hear vapor, but then also those fans are not spinning at full speed. It's kind of odd. And they're like, maybe slowing down and speeding up? It's kind of weird. So, um, it's definitely thawed in here. So we're going to, uh, get our tools out and see what's going on with this. So this is very odd because it clearly here sounds like we're feeding vapor, okay? My liquid line is rather cool. It's not very warm. Now, but which I, I feel like I need to go onto the roof, but these fan motors should be spinning on high speed too. So if it's a low charge issue, I'm afraid to go up and add gas until I figure out why these fan motors don't seem to be spinning on high speed. I could be wrong, but they just don't seem like they're moving enough air for me. Um, so I'm gonna look at the fan motor issue first. Now these fan motors are controlled by the temp control. When the temp control calls, they speed up to high speed. When the temp control satisfies, they slow down to slow speed or low speed. So there's nothing, no reason right now why they shouldn't be running at full speed. Now really quickly, this is a rebranded Kita Therm. It's Arctic Fox. It's just their OEM version um, that they made for Cold Pack or RDI. So the yellow light means that we're calling. Okay. Let's see if we hold this. It tells you that we're set for negative 10. Okay. So we know the control is calling. Now, this is our two speed relay for the fans right here. If I disconnect this red wire, This fans should turn on to high speed and they're not. So I'm intrigued. So, yeah, that's interesting. All right, we're gonna go ahead and test this. I set the control higher. And these fans are not slowing down to low speed. So you heard the refrigeration shut off. Oh, there it goes. What the heck? What is going on here? It sounds like it's in defrost now. This is weird because this does not control defrost. All right. Um, I don't think this is got, I was hoping it was just gonna be like a quick check this check that it could be a coincidence that it just went into defrost It's hard to say um, We'll still have to get up onto the roof, but I'm gonna grab my amp clap and check the defrost here. No, that's weird Is it just a coincidence that it literally just went into defrost when I pushed that button? What are the odds, huh? All right Well, I guess we're gonna need to run up to the roof and see what's going on up there One thing I will say is now that I think about it. These are not standard 12 inch blades um, they're bigger so it's a possibility that I may not even you know normally I could hear the sound and know like hey those aren't spinning fast enough but it may be that they don't spin or make the same sound that I'm used to because they're bigger blades you know um, they may be able to slow the motors down and then have a bigger blade so it still moves the same amount of air because it's all about energy savings with these things so like i said need to jump onto the roof figure out the defrost issue check the charge and then we'll come back and look at the motors again all right we're up here on the roof that looks like oil it looks like a lot of oil um let's open this guy up is it in defrost yes it just went into defrost right there now we're out of defrost, but what's with all that oil? Oh yeah, that's not good. It's all the <laughs> oil from the system. Is it all coming from here maybe, it looks like? It's not from the receiver, it's from the liquid line. The liquid line cracked right here. So we've got a cracked liquid line. Okay, well, we're gonna get what we need to get and uh, try to fix this guy. I mean, it doesn't really have, the thing barely had any gas left in it. And if you look right here, 
it's like damn near cracked completely off. I mean, not even much. So pulled the Schraders out just to vent whatever little bit of vapor was left in there. But I mean, what you guys saw is what was in there. Um, here's one issue. I can fix this. This is no problem. And I can say it's a manufacturer's flaw because if you look at it with the dryer right here, um, there's, you know, <clears throat> this guy right here is sitting right there, but that's still a lot of weight sitting on that top. So really what should happen is this should come over and go to the ground, right? Um, and we'll put the dryer on the ground right here and then come out. It's not a great idea with it the way that it is. So we're going to fix that. Um, but the big issue is how much oil leaked out of the compressor. That's a problem. With a reciprocating compressor with no sight glass, gonna have to take a shot in the dark. I do have oil in my van, so it's not a big deal. I'll put about a pump, pump and a half of oil in there. It's just gonna be an estimation, but it should be enough. One thing to understand is refrigeration oil, the tiniest bit goes a mile. So um, I, uh, probably a solid pump of polyester oil with my uh, oil pump will be just fine. We'll put it into the suction line when it's running, but we'll get some copper, we'll repipe that, put the dryer on the flat surface, come over and then connect back to the liquid line. Another thing is, we'd. what's interesting was between when I was down at the evaporator and I could hear it running to when I came up here, it wasn't really that much time. Why was it still running if it only had that little bit of gas in it? So we don't know if there's a problem with the compressor, but regardless, I am going to, because the system's completely void of gas, right? I mean, we're staring right at it. I'm going to go ahead and put a new dual pressure control in here and probably a new fan cycle control too because if you guys don't already know, these fan cycle switches on these guys are notorious for failing. So we'll probably do that, um, eliminate these stupid things because we're going to have, you know, we don't got any refrigerant in it anyways. But we'll hope that the compressor is still good. I, it probably is, but why was it still running? Because I didn't get up in time to get gauges on it or anything like that, obviously, because you guys saw when I walked up here. but. This thing, I mean, it's literally been a minute and a half, two minutes since I started the clip up on the roof. Like, so why was it still running with that little bit of gas in there, you know? Unless the sound that I was hearing was it turning on and off on low pressure, but it's hard to say. But regardless, we're gonna, we're gonna put the low pressure controls or the pressure controls, you know, over here. So that way we can actually service them in the future um, because the way they are welded on there it's kind of dumb I would hate to go put all this stuff on there and then find out they don't work it's one of those silly things about these systems um, but okay all right so I'm just kind of taking an idea of what I need and then we're gonna go down to the van I should have most of it in stock all right at this point I kind of got this pre-bent right here um, this guy I ended up just breaking it off and it broke off really clean so I'm able to sweat right onto that I made a swage on this fitting I'm kind of put a flare on that uh, putting some nylog on this guy right here. Just put a tiny bit on the threads right there. Okay. And then thread this guy on. A couple ugga duggas, two clicks of the torque wrench. And then uh, we'll get ready to do the other side, get the dryer assembled. Uh, we're moving along. It's a mess, but uh, repiped the discharge line, got rid of all the little connections right here. Put two new T's right there. I'm gonna try to fly with just one fan cycle switch. We'll just disconnect one motor. We're not gonna disconnect them both. Um, so we'll make sure we disconnect the motor furthest away from the header at the end. So we'll disconnect this motor. Um, and then uh, we can always, cause I put T's on here, so we can always add another one later if need be. Um, now the way that I did these is uh, there's a Schrader here and there's a Schrader here. So that way you can actually take this off because there's a depressor in this T. So if you ever needed to change one of these, you can take it off now, okay? So low pressure right here, got a dual pressure control, got a spaghetti of capillaries, but it is what it is. When they make these units junk like this, that's what you gotta deal with. Um, I'll worry about all this here in just a minute. So for now, uh, we're ready to get the evacuation running. So we've got everything all set up, repiped, dryer, secured down on the bottom right there connected in so we're going to turn the evacuation on got the big boy pump here the vpx7 so uh gas ballast is open you can tell the gas ballast is open because it's flashing yellow right here so we'll do the initial pull down like that and then uh let it run for a little bit and i'll clean up and start doing the wiring and everything evacuations about 467 66 we've got power turned on so it's pulley or full and pulling through the entire system. The wiring on this is a disaster. I just, 
it gives me anxiety but it is what it is so we're just uh we'll make sure we secure stuff so that way it doesn't rub out i gotta fix this right here um we've got it connected into here so we have dual pressure control the fan cycle switch turns that fan motor on and off this one will run 24 7. Um, Let's see, we've got power from the pressure control coming from line three, going through the dual pressure control coming out, going into a time delay, an anti-short cycle timer, then coming out of that, going to the contactor coil, then the other side of the contactor coil is wired energized all the time. That way, if it ever ran low again, it wouldn't do the on off, on off, on off. It's a, a 90 second timer. So, um, yeah, or 180 second actually, I think it's a three minute timer. So. Anyways, uh, yeah, we're about ready to uh, put some refrigerant in this guy. We got the MG44 micron gauge showing us system evacuation, okay? It's in its decay, 566. I pulled off the big hoses. I valved off the vacuum core removal tools. And now what I'm doing is actually pulling the evacuation on the manifold gauge set before we hook up our um, refrigerant cylinder because we want to make sure our hoses and our gauges are completely dehydrated, right? So before we open anything up, then we're gonna get some refrigerant, add it into the receiver, and then open it up and start the system up. Got a drum of 404 right there. We weighed it, it weighed 19 pounds. So approximately, what is that? Uh, about 14 pounds of gas in it, I think. Cause usually we're on five or six pounds. So 13 or 14 pounds. Um, but we rode it on there. Now we purged everything up to here and we opened up all the valves. We're still, that's our decay, 578 microns. So the system's nice and leak free. We turned off the disconnect switch because this powers the liquid line solenoid valve downstairs. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna dump as much gas into the high side as possible. Okay, so it's dumping into the high side, the receiver, that liquid line, going down and stopping at the liquid line solenoid valve and then just filling up as much as it can. And then when we turn on the switch in a few minutes, the liquid line solenoid valve will open, the gas will come back up in the low side, activate the low side pressure control, and then the system will turn on. But for now, we have it off, so that way we can just dump as much gas as possible in there. Once we hit positive pressure, we take this guy off, that way we don't introduce any air into the system, and uh, yeah, we're good. So the MG44 can take slight positive pressure. You don't wanna leave it on the system forever like that but we'll put the caps on there. So we have that one in case we need to put a fan cycler on the other condenser fan motor if need be. Um, and then this one's just an extra port. And yeah, we're good. So we're just gonna keep letting it add gas and then we'll, uh, we'll turn it back on here in a minute. All right, here we go. One, two, three, please don't blow up. Okay, low pressure control should start to see uh, pressure once the thermostat downstairs, we have a digital thermostat. So it's gotta go through its power cycle sequence. Then, once it turns on the liquid line solenoid valve, we will start to see pressure come up on the low side. Now, um, the number four terminal in the defrost clock right here is what sends power down to that and energizes it. So it's just a waiting game to wait for the, uh, um, what is it, uh, Arctic Fox or Keta Therm 10 plus defrost controller to basically go through its energizer power up. All right, here we go. And we just turned on. And one condenser fan motor turned on, that's good. So I'm gonna go ahead and add refrigerant. And we've got a sight glass right here. We should be running a clear sight glass. And then that guy won't turn on until it gets to 250 PSI on the head pressure. So, all right, we're doing good now. So we had it set to cut in about 25 PSI, so. All right, so we're just gonna keep adding gas and then uh, we'll follow up in a minute. Fan cycle switch cut in about 260, which is fine. So we're just gonna let it run. Sight glass is flashing, that's a good sign. Meaning that liquid is getting making us all the way through. So we're just gonna go ahead and add a little more refrigerant, make sure that sight glass clears up. Be careful because we do have a heavy load in the box right now, so we don't wanna overload it. We're just adding refrigerant slowly. There is no head pressure control valve on this guy, so it's just gonna be a clear sight glass. So just slowly adding gas. Now. When I say you slowly want to add gas, you don't want to overload it and clear the sight glass when the box is at 60 degrees because theoretically you could add too much gas because you could uh, just basically dump it in there. If you give it time and let it slowly come down to temp, just slowly adding it. So what I'll usually do is add it till it's about three quarters full or a little bit over and then just let it run for 10 minutes then add a little bit more slowly until we get a clear glass. 
we are charged up, everything's good, the system turned back on. Now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna add about a pump of oil. Now we have no idea how much oil was lost, but judging by the little container right there, I'm just gonna make an educated guess and I'm gonna give it one full pump. So we're gonna give it one full draw coming out and then we'll just give it maybe, maybe a pump, maybe just under a pump, okay? Now I already purged everything, it's already ready to go. Okay, so we are pushing against the system running, so we're gonna go slow. Adding it very slowly. Oh. I'm like, I know it's not that hard. I had the ball valve closed, so. Just nice and slow. We don't want to overload it. We're putting it into the suction line. Okay. Close it off. That's all we need. All right, we closed off the ball valve. That's all we need. Um, again, we just added just a little bit to compensate for what was lost. We have no idea how much was lost. We took an educated guess, um, but it's better than not having enough oil, basically. All right, uh, we are back up and running. We have a clear sight glass. It's been clear for a little while. I like how with the, the um, Sporlin catch-all and see-all, you get the male-female sight glass. I like how they mate together like that. It's really nice. Um, fan cycle switch is working. Fan's turning on and off. Everything's looking good, so we're gonna take the gauges off and assemble the unit, and then go downstairs and have a look at the evaporator, make sure those fan motors are running the way they're supposed to. All right, they're running on high speed, so I don't know what I saw earlier. I don't know what that deal was. But yeah, they're kicking right now. I'm really tempted to disconnect that, that two speed because I don't know why it was doing. See? There's no reason right now why it should have done that. that two speed relays jacked up or something. All right, so here's the problem. We have two bad fan motors. They're shorted internally. So this one's running on full speed. What I, the way that I proved this was I disconnected the two speed relays, okay? Uh, basically, if you pull the red wire, you should disconnect the two speed to the motors, but they're all wired together, right? So then I went in and I unplugged every red wire to each motor, and this is the only one running at full speed. These two are running at slow speed. So we have two bad fan motors. Um, they just must be shorted or something inside, who knows. Um, so they still spin, just on slow speed, basically. So this sucks, but it's just silly. Um, there's not much I'm gonna do. It, it'll get them through the weekend. Um, the closest supply house uh, is, is quite a bit away from here. So this should get them by for now, but we'll just have to come back with two more of those fan motors. Weird, I come back in here to check on it, and now the left two motors are spinning at full speed, so that's random. It's just like intermittent, so weird, but we'll get those two new motors, and then the, the right one I think is fine, and then uh, yeah, we'll follow up next week. All right, we are back today. I've got new fan motors. We're going to put on the two left ones. Ironically, they're, they're all running at full speed right now, so it's intermittent with those two left motors doing that. But the box is at negative seven, so we made it through the weekend. Everything's good. All right, replace the two left motors. Um, I purposefully left the two-speed option out of the picture because we've been having way too many problems with these two-speed motors failing. So we're going to leave them in high speed. Um, I hate to do that because I love to stay with OEM, you know, the way they designed it. But I'm telling you, this is one of those things where I'm going to be an engineer. Um, and protect my customer because these two speed are, are costing the customer more You know luckily these motors are under warranty, but these aren't even a couple months old and I've been changing these like crazy lately So uh, the units back up and running We're gonna go jump up onto the roof and have a look make sure everything looks good up there. All right. The equipment's looking good Sight glass is clear. I don't really see a need to do anything else with that um, I'm gonna put some tape on this just to strap it down and that'll be it. Um, I'm gonna set the time on the defrost clock, but we're good to go. This equipment's beat down. There's not a whole lot. There's a lot of things I wanna do to it. I wanna redo all that wiring and everything, but we're not gonna reinvent the wheel here, so. Using your senses when you're walking up to the call or the problem helps. You know, I immediately thought something was wrong. Those fan motors didn't seem like they were spinning fast enough. I kind of doubted myself a little bit and kind of backtracked thinking that maybe they just had bigger fan blades, but that wasn't the case. I, in fact, was seeing an issue where the fan motors were all spinning slow, but it was intermittent. I tried to prove the problem by disconnecting the two-speed wire on the relay, and they didn't slow down. Theoretically, 
or speed up. Theoretically, if they were running in slow speed, if you pulled that red wire in, mind you, not all two speed fans work the same. Okay, these particular ones have the extra leg. There are 208 volt motors, and when it gets that extra leg of power going to that red wire on these ones, that's when they slow down. So the relay in that case only uh, sends power, you know, when it's not calling, basically. So, or vice versa, it, it, whatever it is, I may be mixing it up. But the whole thing is, is that understanding the sequence of operation, understanding how these things work. Um, now, I didn't have a manual that explained how these motors work. I just kind of process of elimination figured it out by having a lot of problems and like playing around with it. Sometimes you got to do that. You know, schematics don't necessarily tell you how the two speed stuff works. Um, they, the manufacturer doesn't have a very good explanation of how they work. Uh, again, I've just kind of figured it out by playing with them. So um, I knew something was up. I, I kind of doubted myself a little bit. But it turns out I was right, obviously, okay? And the process that I went through to find how those motors had failed was a process of elimination. The first thing I did was disconnect the red wire at the relay, right? But that red wire comes from the relay and goes to each motor and then it's wired, right? Daisy chain to each motor. So whenever um, I disconnected that, that would have proved whether or not the relay was the problem, okay? But in this case, the motors were still spinning slow. So then I went and isolated each red wire from each motor. And then the problem persisted with the two left motors, but then the far right motor was still working. Okay. So more than likely what was happening is internally, those motors are shorted somehow. Okay. And it's intermittent. They're making an intermittent connection to where they slow themselves down. And because all the motors were wired together, it was in turn slowing down the last motor too. Okay. Now in this situation, in a perfect world, I would have changed all the motors, but because it was under warranty through the manufacturer, you know, I'm only going to change the ones that presented themselves being bad because the manufacturer is going to test them, right? Well, not always, but sometimes they do. And you don't ever want to send something back, you know, changing it just out of precaution when it's under warranty that that doesn't fly too well with the manufacturer. So, but we proved the point. We went back in and we changed the motors. Now onto the roof where we had the broken liquid line. Okay. There was a couple things going on and I had to make an educated guess when I went up there. First off, whenever you have welded in pressure controls, that's a problem. Okay. Because it's very difficult to replace them. You typically have to remove the entire refrigerant charge. I did not know for sure if the system was still running, but there was no gas left in the system. What you guys saw when I went up there was what was in there. That liquid line just started spraying when I bumped it. And then that was it. It sprayed for like 20 seconds and then the charge was gone. So there was barely any gas left in the system. And the question is, was it running when I was downstairs? It sounded like it was. It sounded like I could hear vapor, but it was kind of on, off, on, off. So maybe it was turning on and off on low pressure. I don't know. And that was my fear. Okay. So out of precaution, because the way it was designed, I installed a new dual pressure control and then also added an extra feature to the system, which is that time delay relay that's going to prevent short cycling. So now that is a what I think it's a delay on break timer. So whenever the power breaks at that relay, right, it it doesn't let it turn back on for another 90 seconds or 180 seconds, whatever it is. OK, so it basically delays the thing from short cycling, from turning on, off, on, off. In some situations, if you have a high pressure control that's that's turning the system off and it's an auto reset, you can short cycle on and off that way or vice versa on low pressure. There's just enough gas in there that it still turns back on, but then it doesn't and then it just goes back and forth. I eliminated that, okay? Of course, I'm keeping the customer in the loop. Now, um, the fan cycle switch, that was a... a we had the gas out of the system. Okay. And I talked to the customer, we have a high failure rate on those fan cycle switches. They go bad all the time. And those of you that work on this RDI equipment, coal pack equipment, or uh, Manitowoc equipment, it's the same stuff. They use these encapsulated pressure controls. And in all fairness, it's I, in my opinion, it's not necessarily the manufacturer's problem. 
it's actually the fact that most of these customers don't do proper preventative maintenance. This is my opinion. I do not know this to be fact, okay? But most of these customers do not do proper preventative maintenance, okay? So they run with dirty condensers. They run with dirty evaporators. And the systems tend to run higher than normal current. So therefore, uh, you start to run into pressure control issues. Now, that is purely my opinion. Um, again, I have no facts to prove that. That's just me using my logic, and I could be completely wrong. I'm sure you guys will light me up in the comments about that. But that's what I believe to be the cause of these pressure controls that constantly go bad. I prefer not to use encapsulated pressure controls. They tend to not have as good of uh, longevity when it comes to high current situations and stuff, especially when you're disconnecting line voltage. It's one thing if you're using one of these tiny little pressure controls and you're just disconnecting low voltage, like 24 volts or something. I find that the encapsulated peanut style controls last a lot longer, but on the higher voltage stuff, you tend to have higher currents. Uh, you are disconnecting a leg of power, depending on which leg of power you're disconnecting in that three phase circuit, you could be running an extreme load through that pressure control and maybe it's not set up to have that and then my theory is you tend to run into more problems now the pressure control that i went and put in for the fan cycle and the dual pressure is a much more heavy duty control it's adjustable and it's field replaceable now because of the way that i installed it because of the way that i put it below schraders and so that way you can pop it off with a schrader below that and you're good to go okay so you guys see how I like to do things. I like to be as thorough as possible, um, adding uh, while being practical at the same time, right? That was a Friday afternoon call. It was getting kind of late. I didn't want to spend a whole bunch of time there. Um, one thing I will say as I'm editing the video, I realized that I didn't show. When I mentioned that I taped the liquid line, I actually strapped down the dryer too. That's something else that was very important because that could lead to a future failure. Um, oftentimes what you'll see on some of these systems, depending on how they're piped and stuff, when the solenoid valve downstairs calls, depending on how they're piped, sometimes you'll see the liquid line vibrate all the way up to the roof. And if nothing's strapped, we could run into the same situation that we did before where the liquid line could potentially crack. So I did strap down that dryer, kind of frustrated that I didn't get footage of that, but I did strap it down in a way so that way it's not going to vibrate and we taped up the liquid line. You know, it's not a perfect situation. That wiring on that thing is a disaster. I've always wanted to redo that wiring, just haven't had an opportunity. But one of these days when I do get an opportunity, I'll redo that. But who knows? Maybe it'll be time to change the equipment before I do that. Yeah, who knows? Um, I really appreciate you guys making it to the end of the video. If you haven't already, please consider supporting the channel. The easiest way to support the channel is watch the videos from beginning to end without skipping through anything. Uh, you can also go to my website, hvacrvideos.com. We have merchandise available on there, the hats, the uh, hooded sweatshirts, beanies. Uh, we have plenty of stock of everything, so help the channel out. Feel free to check it out. Uh, you can also support the channel via Patreon, via PayPal, YouTube channel memberships. There's links in the show notes. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing any tools, I have affiliate links and offer codes set up with truetechtools.com. Uh, go to their website if you like what they have. I have an offer code, big picture, one word. You get an 8% discount on checkout. And if you shoot me an email and tell me what you're going to buy, I can generate an affiliate link. You can still use my offer code. And when you click on my affiliate link, I get a little commission from the purchase and it doesn't cost you anything else. It's just something I have worked out with True Tech Tools. So just another great way to support the channel. Leave me some feedback down in the comments. Let me know what you think. And uh, hey, we will catch you on the next one, okay?